Hi, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, for the second round of Future Proof Artist Talks. Uh, my name is Rachel and I work at Street Level. I exhibited as part of uh, Future Proof in 2016, which was held at the Lily Art Gallery in Logai. Uh, I also exhibited as part of the Jill Todd Photographic Award in 2018, and that was at Street Level. So Future Proof is uh, Street Level's annual showcase of photographic talent selected from across the Scottish degree courses in fine art and photography. It's been going now since uh, 2008 and um, is usually held, apart from this year of course, um, in street level or our partner venues across Scotland. This year we partnered with Source Magazine's BA photography platform in making our selection. And with degree shows being held online this year, Future Proof is too. And you can view the whole exhibition on our website at streetlevelphotoworks.org and it is in three parts. Um, we also have partnered with the Jill Todd Photographic Award for the past two years um, and you will be hearing more information on that soon regarding this year. Uh, so tonight you will hear from six of the exhibiting artists. We have uh, Amalia shipman Muller, Nicola Stead, Amber Brown, Martina Toscova, Stella Rooney and Adam Stent. They will each give a short presentation and at the end we'll hopefully have some time for a short Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for the artists, just pop them into the comments section and I will try and get through as many as possible. So I will now hand you over to Amalia who graduated from Duncan of Jordanson, uh, which is in Dundee. So I'm just gonna put myself on mute and uh, hand it over to you, Amalia. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Amalia. I'm an analog photography artist, primarily focusing on photography theory. So my practice is mainly looking at what thing a photograph exactly is and how we are relating to them and understanding them, particularly with composition and the eye movement that is then caused in various compositions and how the order of looking at those elements in each photograph then causes us to understand them. So for this talk, I thought I would walk you through the works that I have on, um, that I'm showing up free to proof right now. Um, let me just set up sharing my screen to you. Okay, there we go. So you should be seeing right now the um, first photograph in the series openings, which is in the exhibit. And this series was um, one of my favorites that I've done in a while. Um, this photograph is, as you should see, the pinhole photograph. Um, which I just find so fascinating because it was just a small hole and a bit of metal that created this image. So for the series, I had been looking at a lot of theory concerning what the camera is and how it is creating these images and came across a text from Wilhelm Fluser where he defines a camera as a black box mechanism, which I thought was such an interesting way of defining a camera. Now, on the one hand, yeah, it's kind of true in my opinion. You do see what comes in and what comes out. Therefore, one can consider the camera a black box, but we also know with digital cameras and analog that we understand the mechanism that is happening there. So I wanted to, on the one hand, discuss all of these contradictions and truths within that statement um, within this series. So for the camera, I had built my own, I actually had to um, find some of my old calculus notes from high school in order to do this, to find the right focal length to, um, so that the image would be in focus. And I thought pinhole photography was the perfect medium to express all these thoughts that I had surrounding the camera because it was the simplest form of it. I've taken out the shutter, the lens and as many elements as I could to bring it down to the core or not the core, but the simplest method to take a photograph, to take out all of that noise that's happening in between. And what I loved about then creating these photographs was the object hood of the actual image itself. I felt that was such a good way of um, portraying this bizarre connection that we seem to have to photography in our, current, um, in our current culture and society. I mean, photographs have become so ingrained in how we communicate and in how we relate to each other. I'm sure we've all been noticing over the past months with so much moving online and with so much connection being through social media now that images are and video is more of a form of communication than text frequently. For me personally, being a dyslexic, I do always prefer a good graphic over a big text. 
I'm sure some of you can relate. So I had been, ooh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So with this series, I chose to make these panoramic images because they were breaking up your sense of compositional structure that we're used to. And um, we're breaking up at least the standard eye movement that I'm used to within an image. And as I was taking these photographs, I kept wondering what exactly am I choosing as the subject of these? Because there wasn't a specific thing that I'd gone into this series looking at, but I always knew this is the space that I want to be photographing. And I, I, had, a, I had a certain method to it. I couldn't put my finger on it till actually just a couple of weeks before I had um, sent these photographs to Future Proof. I had kind of put my finger on it, realized, oh, I'm focusing on what I dubbed in between spaces. So those areas that are used as to pass from place A to B, but are not really given a lot of thought. A couple of years ago, I had done a series on stairwells as well, looking at very much the same thing without understanding it at the time. And so these images, I had been looking at exactly that. And I hope I've captured some element of that um, for you to see, because I, I just found them to be pinpointing something within photography that I really have been struggling with and continue to struggle with, which is this sense of responsibility of what can be photographed and what can we not photograph. And, what, and more specifically, what is then gonna be memorialized within a photograph and then what do we not? And so using this style of photography, I wanted to be photographing those spaces that are just not really considered like that corner that you walk by a hundred times every day on your way home and you know, like the back of your hand, but you're not actively spending time there seeking it out. And so I wanted to contrast that with this very precious medium as well as um, keep it very referential to bring it back to how is the camera functioning? How is it making these images by having these very um, self-referential elements within the photograph? So as you can see, there's some parts of the film itself still visible as well as this wonderful, uh, almost lens flaring, not that there was a lens, but this reflection that you had within the images. And the second series that I am showing on Future Proof um, is dealing with a lot of the same issues and from a, uh, ooh, sorry, again, lost my train of thought, is dealing with a lot of this um, same thematical issues. But for me, this was such an interesting series to be doing because I was taking digital photographs. As I said at the beginning, I'm an analog photographer. So this was such a step out of my comfort zone, but in the end was discussing very much the same thing from the complete opposite perspective, which I'll elaborate on a little bit. So what you see here is a mutoscope that I had built. It's um, a method to uh, show stop motion photographs to create a sort of film. They used to show, they actually used to show those little like dirty videos where you'd have a girl lift up her skirt and you'd see her ankle or something, you put a quarter in. And so I appropriated this mechanism to um, show series of photographs, which I think, yes, I have one here. Um, that I had on these individual pages taken. And you then see almost like this video of the camera looking around and trying to discover the space. And with this series, it was again, this trying to highlight the preciousness of photographs and the preciousness that we either place on them or the lack thereof, particularly with the, um, um, phones having cameras now. I'm sure I definitely, and many people I know to have just hundreds of photos on their phone that I'm not even thinking about and thinking about the fact that they're just now on there and online and what they're doing and how many I'm not really considering what I'm photographing within them and so with these I wanted to highlight that by over exaggerating it so I'd been taking I'd been pulling out my phone in various scenarios and then just moving it around as though the frame of the image was discovering the space and as within the opening series I showed you at the beginning, trying to understand the composition, except here using that standard framing to understand if I move my camera just a couple centimeters, then the frame is gonna be completely different. And so the leading lines in the image are gonna cause your eye to move differently. And how is that changed than if I move my camera a couple centimeters higher or angle it a bit differently? And then in this mutoscope mechanism, you can really see 
what I was seeing on my phone screen as I was taking them, which I just, I, I, I just loved it. It absolutely fascinated me. And um, yes, here's another one again. Now, this being an interactive piece, um, Future Proof does have videos of, on their social media, which I am sure you've seen. If not, I would definitely recommend you look at. Um, this one was also another in-between space as they all have been looking at just the floor and this place that we're not spending, or I'm at least not spending a lot of time considering until I kind of make myself say, okay, where am I? What am I looking at? What happens when I point my phone at it? And how is it perceiving that space then? Now, I know questions are at the end, so please do write any in if you have them. And, um, oh, I haven't been keeping track of time. I hope I'm good on time. Um, as an American, I just wanna say happy Thanksgiving, by the way, I hope everyone's doing well. No, that was yesterday, but um, I'm very thankful to have been a part of this and I hope everyone's finding things to be thankful for. And I'll pass it on to the next person. Thank you very much, Amalia. It was really interesting. <laughs> that was really nice. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, just like you said, pass it on. Then we'll go to Nicola Stead, uh, who graduated from City of Glasgow College. And I'll, I'll let you take it away. You're just on mute, um, Nicola, sorry. Is that me? That's you, lovely. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Nicola Stead. Uh, this project is called Glasgow Women. And um, the inspiration for the project came from my involvement with Glasgow Women's Library, which I joined in the summer of 2019. And their mission to champion the historical, cultural and political contributions of women inspired me to research the often hidden histories of Glasgow's women in more detail. It was through research at the library that I discovered the grave of Isabella Elder, um, who um, I discovered that in Glasgow's necropolis. Elder was uh, one of Glasgow's greatest philanthropists and she took a particular interest in women's education, financing and supporting the foundation of Queen Margaret College in 1883 which enables Scottish women to be admitted to higher education for the first time. Elder also took an active interest in the welfare of the women of Govan, where she established a school of domestic economy for local women, among other acts of benefaction within the community. So I decided I would like to explore Elder's legacy through women in Glasgow now, um, to discover if there existed a positive continuation of our pioneering and empowering work while also creating a record of the experiences of women in the city and offering a celebration of their lives. So I began researching Isabella Elder's legacy in Govan. I discovered that women are very much at the heart of this community with many women's groups and women's led organizations in the area. Two seconds, sorry, yeah. Um, so I got to know many of these organizations well, such as Gilded Lily, whose aims are to support women to succeed in their own ambitions through a variety of workshops and weekly group meetings. I was struck by the similarities between the scope of their activities and what I had read about Elders School of Domestic Economy for women in Govan 135 years earlier. It was interesting to see these parallels so far apart in time. Another organisation that I became involved with was Govan Community Project, who support asylum seeker and refugee communities in southwest Glasgow. Tracy is the head of the charity and I got to know her well throughout the project. I spent a lot of time with um, Govan Community Project's women's group, which is a place for women from asylum seeker and refugee communities in Govan to come together and share food discussion and participate in art activities. I learned on my visits how vital this community connection was for the women and that cooking and sharing a meal together were central to how they bond within the group. 
In our conversations, I asked the women to consider whether they thought there were good opportunities for them in Govan. Most of their responses were positive, and I was struck by the women's resilience and optimism. I also asked them to choose a place that they would like to be photographed, somewhere that represented a safe space for them. Many women chose the location their organisations met, while others chose their home or a place that felt like home, such as a local park or a favourite cafe. Salma is originally from Syria and has lived in Glasgow for a year and a half. She told me she felt there were good opportunities for asylum seeker and refugee women to be part of the wider community in Govan. However, she believed the women really have to invest their time to see the results. Fusia is originally from Algeria and has lived in Govan for two years. She's a regular member of Govan Community Projects Women's Group and also attends the cooking and sewing classes in Gilded Lily. She told me that she believes that these opportunities have helped to build her confidence. Another group I became involved with was the Governites Pensioners Group. This is a group of Govan women, mostly in their 80s, who met on a weekly basis in the hub, which is a community space on Govan Road. They immediately welcomed me into their group and were very engaged with my project. I spent a lot of time with them talking and listening to their stories and got to know them well. This is Julia. She's lived in Glasgow her whole life. She's a regular member of the Governites and at 79 years old, she's considered the baby of the group. Nancy is 89 years old and is a lifelong Govan resident. She described the Governites as a place to go to be with her friends. This is Janet. She's 84 and has also lived in Govan her whole life. Janet tells great stories and is a really strong, positive character within the group. She told me she believes there are good opportunities in Govan for women her age. Throughout this project, I was struck by the pride and resilience of the women in Govan and by the strength of the community they've created together. The women's groups provide support, nurture and inspiration for the women involved. And I believe that they represent a positive legacy of the pioneering and empowering work that Isabella Elder carried out before them. That's me. Oh, thank you very much, Nicola. I'd like seen the pictures, obviously, and we'd had them on um, the online gallery, but I was looking forward to hearing a wee bit more about them. Yeah. Uh, so that was, thank you very much. No problem. Have you managed to do much during lockdown or has it yeah. been sort of... Well, at first it was quite difficult, but um, at the moment I'm working on a community um, project with the Housing Association in Govan. They've commissioned me to do a portrait project of the community, so that's been good, and it's been a good way to mm -hmm. reconnect with a lot of these people because their groups haven't actually met face to face since the lockdown. So, really, kind of seen how important their groups actually were now. That's great. Um, I'll just have to apologise to Amalia as well. I couldn't get to chat too much after your talk um, I think my flatmate must have had Netflix on and it was seriously lagging so it kind of threw me a wee bit um, so we'll just move on now um, to Amber Brown who graduated from Edinburgh College of Art um, I'll just put myself on mute again and then if everyone get their cameras back off and yeah take it away. Hi yeah um, I'm just trying to share my screen now if it'll work. Here we go. Yeah, so I'm Amber, um, I'm a photographer and a printmaker. Um, I graduated from Edinburgh College of Art, like Rachel said, and I'm now based in Durham. I moved kind of in the middle of all of this um, to go and do my master's in gallery studies. So I'm kind of hoping to continue as a curator and as an artist as well and combining those two. So my work explores notions of place. Um, notions of belonging, home and quite specifically northernness. Um, I do that through looking at different narratives. Um, some are quite personal and um, like you'll see, some are cultural and some are quite political. And the processes that I work with are predominantly large format photography and printmaking. I tend to focus around processes that are quite slow and um, processes that have a lot of repetition in them and feel like somewhat ritualistic. So the following slides are from my graduate project, which is called It Must Be Somewhere Here. And I started this project over a year ago now. I think it was 
the start of last summer, so about May time, uh, leading up to my final year. And I'm still working on it now, to be honest. Um, both of my granddads were miners in the northeast of England. And at the beginning of this project, I was very much interested in family history, um, tracking down ancestry and trying to gather as much documentation about this as possible. And I found this photograph at Woodhorn Museum, which is an ex colliery museum in Northumberland in Ashton, uh, which is where he worked as a miner. And he's actually in the middle of this photograph. I'll see if I can get my cursor over it. Just here, uh, right in the middle, behind the little like pole of this floor. And we found this in an interpretation panel in the display talking about um, miners' picnics. And so this photograph was taken in 1953 by a local photographer called William Ward. And it is in a town called Bedleton, which was also a mining town, and it is of the Northumberland Miners Picnic. So from then on, I became quite obsessed with um, gathering any documentation um, related to working um, in the mining industry and any sort of maps, um, geographical maps, any studies, anything that I could find. And I guess then I started visiting those lands and trying to see what, what they're like now compared to what they used to be like. So it's a year long survey and it's probably going to go on for I'd say at least like two years now given the time. Um, it's all of documentary landscape photography and it looks at the deep coal mining landscape in the northeast of England. Um, kind of all over the place to be honest, it's pretty widespread. Um, when I started researching I found quite quickly that there tends to be like a triangle you can draw on the map of the northeast and that's predominantly where all the coal mines were. And it tends to filter off and off the further north you go. And I lived in, I still live really in Amble, um, which is kind of, if anyone knows the area, like between Annick and Morford, like it's much more north, north than Newcastle. And the mines get denser and denser as you go down to County Durham. And so I was using a printmaking technique called the Port Polymer Gravel, and that's somewhat similar to copper plate etching. Um, it's a process where I was taking these black and white by four images um, and transferring them into the intaglio plates. Um, so the image was etched within the, like, the grooves of the plate and then I would ink that up and print it. And I think what I liked about this process is that it relies on trial and error quite a lot. It's, it was hard to get the hang of and I'm still not an expert at it. I think it'll take a long time to get to that level, but I like that kind of human interaction with it and it relies on my input into the print and depending on how it comes out. And so I was taking these images of woodland, uh, nature reserves, or other unidentifiable forms of what used to be colliery lands. So this is the Woodhorn Coal Track, um, which used to take for various destinations and various mine openings. Um, and I think the images, what struck me most starting with this was that they're quite painterly. Um, I think that there's kind of quite a timeless aspect to this technique and that you can't quite tell when the image was taken and it could be 50 years ago, it could be 100 years ago, it could be now, but it's quite hard to tell because there's not there's no people in them. Um, I tried really hard to not get any aspect of like a modern life in them, like you can't spot phone lines, you can't spot um, any people in the background. Unless if anyone manages to find one, like, please tell us, because then I'll <laughs> kind of change it a little. Um, but yeah, I was taking these images and then I started looking at places that were built from the ground up for the mining industry. So on this slide, I talk about how it's quite a mindful process. It's knowing when to stop wiping the plate and knowing when's too much ink and when's too little ink, when that's going to completely change the image. and blurring those boundaries between the photograph and the painting or the print. Um, so techniques that are quite laden in antiquity and techniques that make you consider what it is that you're looking at. So this is an image of Siam Fort. Um, Siam was built around a mine and some of the other works that I was showing, this one here is Easant and Colliery, um, which a lot of amazing projects have been done by local um, photography collectives uh, such as Side Gallery uh, and the Photography and Film Collective have done a lot of work with Easington and the Easington community and here I was mainly interested in the texture 
and then I moved on to looking at remains. Um, so this is a very small village called Longest um, in Northumberland. And it's actually the remains of the shaft winding gear. So when I was shooting this image, again, five four, and I think it, it is a talking point in some sense, like the cameras that we're using, especially large format. Um, a bloke stopped us when I was shooting it and started asking what I was doing. And it turned out that the only houses near where this is, is just one row of colliery houses. And he lived in one of them. And he'd actually done a load of research for a local community group on the area. And he'd done a lot of digging into the houses and the history of who lived there and what their connection was to the land. So we got chatting about it and exchanged some images and some details. And I'm hoping to use a lot of that archival part of the project to make an artist book at some point. Um, so I think that's kind of the next step with this is um, making it into a book that kind of ties up that archival history as well. And then from then on, I started to move towards placing the work in a more modern context. Um, a lot of the feedback that I was getting was that to push the boundary, I would need to make it relevant now. And so I started visiting um, places that were ex colliery sites. And um, this is a power station. Um, it's overlooked by land that was ex colliery again um, in Northumberland. And it's actually, if anyone is a fan, it's where Mick Critchlow and Chris Killick did a lot of their sea calling works. And I find the land quite fascinating. Um, I really loved shooting this image. And I'm definitely influenced by contemporary and documentary photographers and those who've worked within the communities. Um, but here I was looking mainly at what the land is like now and what kind of impact it's left on it. And this is an example of a man all at landscape, um, which I like to refer to as um, where, man wants his land, where man wants laid his hand, if I can talk. Um, so I made a little concertina book about this and um, this is an industrial landfill, um, which is now being exposed um, because the rocks gradually eroding from this cliff on the beach. And I think in this photograph, it looks it looks really big. Um, it looks like it could be bigger than a person, but it's it's in reality, it's quite a small um, piece of land that this is happening to, but it stretches right along the beach. And I'm interested in the idea of like the post-industrial landscape and specifically with this, um, it kind of came to my attention when I started reading about it in uh, local newspapers and how um, people didn't quite know what to do with it. Now the landfill and the waste had started to peek through the rocks and it was a bit of a battle in knowing how to tackle it and how much it was going to cost to sort this out and if people should just leave it to, to erode and to gradually kind of float away into the sea. And then this is probably um, my favourite image from the series to shoot. Um, this one looks at the impact the industry has left on visual landscape too. Um, it's called Manganese Beach um, because the chemicals in the mine water, um, which are still pumping through the air, have left an orange tinge to the rocks on the beach. And when I saw it, I, I went specifically there. Um, this is in County Durham. So I remember driving an hour and a half or something to get to this spot and then walking for ages to find it and it, it was just quite beautiful to see but at the same time I do know that across the northeast this is recorded by various people that um, in various levels dependent on the land and how long the land was used for collieries um, there tends to be like a higher point of certain chemical which has left this sort of tinge on various parts of the land and I found that really interesting. And so it's about the history of the land. Um, it's about the impact of industry and the current and future state of it. So I guess I'm thinking like, what will other landscapes look like when current industries cease to exist in the future? And how much longer will these remains last? Because right now we don't know like the longevity of how long this is gonna look um, so vibrant. and. If not, at what point does that start to change? So I'm still working on the project. Um, 
as I'm sure all of us have found, lockdown's kind of changed how we've been approaching this um, and access to facilities as well. Um, luckily, around the time of Future Proof, um, I got some support from the Richard and Siobhan Cowan Coward Foundation um, to continue the work. And so I've been taking some time away recently to reflect on it and uh, to continue studies elsewhere. But I think that in the future, it is most likely to be a book and hopefully an exhibition when we can do that. Um, I'd really like to find a way of integrating the archival history and the prose, um, any sort of writing related to the piece, because I think that is something that lacks. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of internal history and a lot of things that I want to say about the images and about the knowledge behind the images um, and I need to find a way of how to get that across. So yeah, I'm hoping to continue working between the North East and Scotland and um, hopefully this will realise in its own way. Um, but I'm more than happy to chat about it and this is how you can get in touch. But um, thank you to Street Level for having us. Uh, it's been lush to be part of Future Proof and it's been great to hear from all the other artists so far. Thank you very much, Amber. Um, it's really good to hear that you're going to be continuing the project and it's not just stopped and, and that you're getting help with that as well to continue. That's nice to hear. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing the book. <laughs> I've tried to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. I think it's sorted out. No, that's you, that's you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, next we have uh, Martina Tuskova, who's graduated from Grey's School of Art. So again, I will just pop myself back on mute and invite Martina just to take it away. Can you hear me now? Hi. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Martina Tosco. I will try to share my screen now. Is it this one? So, is it okay, Rachel? So, with my project, uh, I was comparing nature to us humans. Uh, of course, we are part of the nature, but we are slightly different. Um, what I was basically doing is um, I was looking at fragility and the power of humans, human body, and comparing to flowers in this case. You can see this is my small sketch that I had in my head to just photograph model with legs up and flowers. And actually, it developed into this angled legs with roses that I really like. Uh, it, it, it's giving me a slightly surreal feeling. Um, this picture, it's obviously from the same session, but this picture was rejected straight away because it was just the moment when it was faulty picture. After months, when I came back to the picture, I realized this is beautiful picture and I like it. And as you can see, uh, I put embracing imperfection and uniqueness. So it, it's telling me that sometimes the mistakes can be beautiful mistakes. And there is also nothing like mistake. Um, this picture, yeah, I was also comparing, I, I was playing around the, with minimalism and maximalism because uh, for people who knows me, they know that those white images, they are super minimalistic to, for my personality. So um, as you can see the sketch, it's the, the drawing, it's uh, showing you a lot of mess and flowers in the nature, uh, in the hair of the model. And the model is kind of like praying to the nature, looking up to the nature. So it's saying about gratefulness to nature. This image, uh, I like the incognito part that we can't see the face. And it's again giving me more surreal feeling to the image. And it's again pointing up to the skies, to the universe. So it's saying to me that there is something about us. Um, 
the model should embody uh, the mother nature. So I was basically playing around to have fun and covering my model with beautiful mess of petals. And the last image, um, it's obviously very different and it's very contrast contrasty. And I just love this image. I also put it on the front of the book I printed. It's amazing feeling to have printed work in this di digital world. So I made, I did a lot of images. So what you can see is just small part of it and the gold petals with a contrast of the black background. Yeah, that's why it's my favorite image. This is the Gray School of Art virtual exhibition. It's in the middle, in the epicenter. So what I like about this work that it's very me. It's very contrasty and maybe a bit mess, but beautiful mess with the petals. And yeah, adaptability is the huge um, hashtag keyword for this project. And I, I really enjoyed it. I must say that for a very important part for me, it's to have fun, enjoy. What can be tricky when there is deadline or when we are thinking that it's really important for us to make amazing work, but it's basically I'm doing my work for myself. So it's kind of like psycho hygiene for us. And I believe most of us, we are doing uh, our work for us. And if other people like it and other people can take something from it, it's just giant, uh, giant plus. And if you can hear some bites, it's my body. <laughs> uh, that's all from me for now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Martina. Yeah, I did. I took a note down about the digital collage because I did notice how different it was from the, the white images of the, the female figure. Really simple. Um, and I quite like that. I really like the difference between like the full, like all technology making this um, digital collage. But you're, you're talking about technology and nature. So you're definitely contrasting it really well. I really like that. Yeah, actually, I'm continuing with this project and I'm starting to uh, do kind of a sculpture that would be like the legs up and it would be actually base. So, yeah, I'm developing this project and I'm really excited from making a base for flowers in the shape yeah. of the <laughs> Amazing. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so next we have uh, Stella Rooney, uh, another graduate from Duncan of Jordanson. So, yeah, I'll let you go. And one minute. Um, great. Can everyone see that? Okay. Okay. Great. Um. So, yeah. Uh, my name is Stella Rooney, and um, as Rachel said, I'm I graduated um from DJ CAD um in Dundee. Um, obviously very strange work um period to graduate in um. So in my case, a lot of the work I made kind of changed and I had to adapt because I couldn't do what I planned to do. Um, so the first photograph here is um, the only photograph here, which is a digital photograph. Um, um, and in this, this is a photograph from my degree school project, which um, was based around the Timex factory in Dundee, um, which was a mass employer in the city. It was once the... Um, one in three people in the city were employed in it. Um, and it's significant for a number of reasons, um, mainly because um, it, it was, there was a very famous dispute at the factory in the late 90s when the company Clyde tried to make um, many of the workers redundant, um, but also because Dundee has this interesting history of, um, of technology, um, which many people don't know about. Um, and but also because Dundee is a city which is being um, in some ways rebranded as a kind of like um, new and exciting place to be, which it is because it's a brilliant place. But 
at the same time, uh, many of the new developments in the waterfront area, um, they haven't been able to recreate the kind of feeling that was lost or the jobs that were lost when many of the massive employers in the city in the late 90s, the last of them left, and then recently um, the Michelin factory in Dundee shut. Um, so this landscape of deindustrialization uh, is something I'm very interested in. Um, and I didn't get to finish my film about Timex, so I managed to make a short film about it. Um, but it's something I want to revisit when it's actually safe to, to do so. Um, but moving on from this, um, and when I, we've had to go back, had to go into lockdown for the first time, I moved back to the east end of Glasgow where I'm from. Um, and many of these similar issues of um, deindustrialization, of um, low paid, um, long hours work dominating um, working class communities continue. Um, this is a photograph right from where I live and uh, next to the bar is. Um, and to kind of try and figure out this confusing and difficult period, I, I kind of picked up my camera um, and I, I work with moving images as well as photography, but um, I felt like film was just a much more effective medium to kind of capture this weird moment um, when everything was shut. Um, this is another photograph in the East End um, around the corner from the Barra's Market. And I guess I find these images quite lonely and bleak, um, which perhaps maybe um, reflects the feeling. Um, but that's not really something I aim to do in my work. I'm really interested in uh, the human element and human beings. Um, and that's obviously something that's quite difficult to do under lockdown. Um, but I tried to, to capture images that had some sort of humanity to them, um, which was quite difficult to do. Um, so I've decided to show some images of work I've been working on since uh, the images I put into the Future Proof exhibition, because it's kind of what I'm thinking about, what's on my mind. Um, and these aren't entirely um, fully formed thoughts, but I just thought it might be interesting to think about. Um, so over the summer, I decided to take um, some more personal photographs as well like trying to address the fact I felt that there wasn't a lot of kind of human presence in the photographs I was taking. Um, and then also maybe because like the smaller things in our life in lockdown become more universal possibly. Um, so this is a photograph of my mum um, and that's at the, the clap um, at eight o'clock every Thursday, um, which I think kind of was a really interesting moment um, but as I will go, come back to later um, for kind of like multiple reasons. But at that time, it was it was a very emotional and powerful thing. Um, this is another image, which is a photograph of my boyfriend shaving his head um, when many people did that during lockdown because uh, he couldn't go to the hairdressers. Um, and he was quite annoyed at me for taking the photograph, but um, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> and this photograph here is a photograph of my grandparents on my birthday. Um, which we had to do outside in their garden. Um, and I'm sure many people experienced um, having to see your loved ones with massive coats on in the garden. And I'm still trying to do that right now um, as Glasgow's back in lockdown. Um, so, and then um, this next image is something um, that I began working on in September. Um, when I began doing some work with Unison, which is the public service union, and um, where I, I was um, kind of contracted to make a short film for them, and I got to um, interview and record many um, low paid women workers who had worked through the pandemic, um, cleaners, caterers, catering assistants, teaching assistants. Um, and I found this really valuable because um, it was just so important to listen and to hear the stories of those who had worked through a pandemic, especially um, low paid women who often had, you know, perhaps weren't given the recognition they deserved. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that a common feeling was feeling undervalued, a lack of recognition, um, not doing the job for plaudits or for claps. <laughs> so this uh, photograph is of Sally, who's a home carer in Glasgow. Um, and I think 
the kind of images of workers do speak for themselves. You know, people, I, I think people are clearly quite fed up in the period of working so hard um, in a really difficult, stressful time. But I think that I've, I want to capture a kind of still having a, a degree of power in there because I think that many of the workers I was very privileged to speak to and document still retained a lot of a lot of power. Um, and this image I actually took last week, um, it's a photograph of um, Gordon who worked in COVID ICU ward uh, when I was working on another film with Unison, um, where I, this time for healthcare workers. Um, and um, yeah, listening and recording the stories of those in the front line, um, it, it's, I think it's kind of important to try and make it a rewarding experience for both of you and making people want to tell you things that they want to tell you and talk about what they want to talk about. And for me to do that, it feels like quite a, um, I feel like it's a real privilege because I think it's, it's very important. Um, and I guess it's like, you know, I, I think some of these images are quite difficult to um, kind of describe because I think they say a lot in themselves. Um, and this last image here, um, which is the last image I'm going to show, is a photograph of Linda, who's a catering worker in the NHS. Um, and I think the thing that puts all these images together, even though they might seem a bit different, is that um, I think what's important to me as an artist is thinking about how a photograph can be a way that we preserved our memories of either loved ones or significant events. Um, and also the idea that these these small interactions in your workplace or in your families, they matter and that they contribute to a wider idea of history um, and that history is not something which is immovable, it's something that ordinary people contribute towards and can change. Um, and also thinking about um, what does normal look like and who does it work for as we move in and out of lockdowns. Um, for most of the workers I spoke to, going back to normal meant being overworked and underpaid, um, but also retaining a sense of power, being part of some sort of collective, and then also in the kind of more personal photographs of um, a relationship of kind of like love and care of someone, of me taking it, of someone having a close relationship. And I guess I think the things it brings together is like in these different types of interaction of showing that you care for someone or for, um, I guess, kind of standing up for your rights at work, et cetera. I think that, um, I think they are significant and they they work towards kind of, you know, the kind of world that we would want to live in. Um, and I, going forwards, I plan to continue taking these photographs um, in my personal life and of, um, of workers who have been working through the pandemic. Um, I think it's important um, because I think documenting everyday activities and labour is something that um, people don't often think to do um, and has a just has a um, real significance as we kind of move perhaps out of this period into the new and think about what kind of world we want to live in. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. Thanks. I'll stop my screen sharing. Here you go. <laughs> Thanks very much, Stella. That was uh, brilliant. And it was so good to see images that we hadn't seen um, yet. And it seems that you've been pretty busy uh, despite everything. And you seem to kind of, um, I don't know, there's something quite positive about the images, um, even though obviously it's quite a rubbish time for everybody, but there is a, a nice positive spin to it. So thank you very much. Um, so finally, um, thanks for your patience, Adam. We have you. That's all um, right. <laughs> Um, graduated from Glasgow School of Art, uh, and I'll just let you take it away. Okay, um, sharing my screen. Is that not yet? Is that done yet? Um, not yet. Okay, I see you. Okay, go. Cool. Get rid of that. Okay, uh, so my name is Adam Stent and my practice is specifically focused on the constructed image 
and trying to convey a sense of truth within the artificial. Uh, my project that is being exhibited within Future Proof is called Twins, and it examines my relationship with my twin brother, uh, specifically focusing on the origins of our differences, the biggest difference between us being our sexualities, the reason I chose to explore this is that within my relationship with my twin brother, there is a profound closeness, which is unmatched by any other relationship in my life. Uh, the root of this probably being that we shared an upbringing and we share also 100% of the same DNA. Uh, because of this growing up and even still today, we are defined by our similarities and our differences with one another. And what I mean by this is, especially in a family setting, we exist as a pair rather than individuals. And looking specifically at our relationship allowed me to address through my work, broader ideas about nature and nurture and considers how to exist as an individual. So this project was heavily informed by the concept of the family photograph and the family photograph, or more specifically the family uh, like portrait being a heavily staged and artificial image that is used as a point of reference for future generations to look back upon and scrutinize. So from looking at the family photograph, I knew that I wanted to create images that appeared artificial and staged, but still held uh, truths about both our relationship and the broader themes that I've talked about. So to explore the connection between our genetic makeup my brother, he came up to Glasgow and we visited the biology department at Glasgow University, where we both created a genetic fingerprint of our DNA on these agar jelly plates, which I've got a photo of later. So in this first picture, I, the kind of aim throughout it was to try and find a sense of opposites within this process of showing our similarities. So this image shows one of the machines used in the process, and I shot it because of the contrasting negative and positive electric wires that you can see. And I used a black background because I wanted my photographs to exist in between the space between real and unreal. And this second picture, which is a portrait of my twin brother, I wanted to give him the space to ex uh, exist as an individual, which is why I photographed him alone but also to portray the sense that we exist as a pair. I photographed myself wearing the same shirt and in the same pose, uh, which can be seen here, but I've got quite a startled look on my face. I think that was the flash. <laughs> uh, so this means that visual similarities and differences can be drawn and compared between the two photographs. Uh, oh, sorry, as well, I used contrasting colored lighting gels just to really highlight the, the difference between us. And then I took this photograph halfway through the making of our genetic fingerprint and it shows both samples of my own DNA and his DNA in the two little tubes. And as well as that, it shows the machine used to analyze the samples. I chose to isolate the equipment to cement the constructed qualities of the photograph, which although artificially staged shows the truth about our identities and likeness. I also thought it was important to show how small a sample you need to analyze the whole of someone's DNA and that someone's identity can exist solely in this tiny little tube, uh, which shows how seemingly insignificant things makes up the basis of who we all are. This kind of condenses down the entirety of someone's identity into this small indistinguishable tube. Uh, this fifth picture, these were the resulting gels that we made that uh, were unfortunately kind of degraded between the walk from the Glasgow Biology Lab to my home studio. Um, but I kind of thought that this better shows the results of having a genetic code who like that fundamentally makes what you are, but also the environmental factors on the identity of the individual. So I feel like although the experiment was not successful, it kind of 
more successfully shows the complex makeup of two separate individuals. And then this final picture that was informed by the relationship of us as twins and also the different lives we leave and identities we have. This can be seen in the physical differences between us, especially those caused from environmental factors such as tattoos, uh, specifically my little dodgy one there and my brother's one there. Uh, and the use of varying black and white uh, presents the idea that we are both opposites, but also the same. And I wanted to show one point of contact to reinforce the notion of inseparability that twins have, which is also why I showed him as my reflection, as he is someone that will always be there and this further cements the roles that we play in each other's lives. And that's my presentation. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I, I was wondering um, if your brother, um, what he had to say about the project and was he really quite into it or had any reservations? Um, he's, whenever I show him my work, he, he just acts like he doesn't get it. I feel like he puts on like a bravado, bravado yeah. face, but I feel like deep down he must have liked it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise he wouldn't have been a part of it. Exactly, I know, I was thinking that must have been, took, a lot, took a lot of time. Uh, I, we got quite into this photograph. Yeah, you can see there's quite a lot of concentration there. Yeah, well. <laughs> you can see it in his eyes. <laughs> Right, well, that is all our talks. Um, if everyone wants to turn their cameras back on and their audio, I was just going to suggest if um, any of the artists, first of all, if you any, you know, had any comments for each other's work, any any questions for each other, no pressure. Just um, thought I'd give you a chance before we open up to the the Q and A from the audience. Can I ask Stella a question? Of course. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I really loved your work and um, both projects, um, but especially um, the Degree Show project um, that looked at the factory. And I just wondered if you could say a bit about the, um, the film that you mentioned, because that sounded really interesting. And if, like, if we can watch it anywhere. Yeah, so uh, my initial plan for my Degree Show was to make this film about um, Timex and Dundee now. Um, and so I kind of shot a bit of the footage and I edited it um, and it's on my, um, it's on my Vimeo account and it's on my website. It's, um, so it's just stellarooney.com. Um, it, there's a link to it on there. Um, and so that's the kind of like snippet of, of that. Um, but yeah, um, I, I mean, it's difficult because like I really wanted to finish making it, but I was also working with a, a history group of people who used to work in the factory and they were all pensioners so um it's quite difficult to do that during covid um so i hope that i will get to go back and finish it um it's not something that i um you know has went to the back of my mind it's just kind of it's just the way it is um unfortunately but i um i think it's really interesting because dundee is a, a city which is like um the the north of England has a lot of industrial history and has been completely deindustrialized, and um, so it's something that I think is I'm still very interested in. So if there's no more, um, I have a mixture of questions and a couple of just observations from the audience so far. And um, I'll start off just with the comments. Um, so from Alicia Bruce um, to Nicola, she says that the Govan Housing Project sounds great, and she's looking forward to seeing it. Um, also, Michelle McLean says, uh, great images, Martina. Uh, looking forward to seeing more. Um, and also, Alicia Bruce says that Stella also does amazing campaign work for Better Than Zero. It was great to meet you at ECA a few years back. Um, so I'll get on to the questions now. Um, first, from Alan Kelly to Amalia. Uh, Alan says, uh, these are really interesting. Uh, apologies, I had to leave for a few seconds. If you haven't already mentioned, can you say something about the exposures for the pinhole images, please? Yeah, of course. Um, the exposures with those pinhole cameras were um, interesting to do. Some of them that I showed you 
um, and that are on the website were from around 10 seconds to 15, whereas there were a couple others where I had um, to deal with reciprocity failure, and those were a couple hours long. Um, reciprocity failure being when the exposure time is too long, and so a bunch of math jumbo um, later, you have to add more time to the exposure. But with these specific images, I had built the camera so that I could calculate the exposure time. So by having measured the diameter of the pinhole, as well as knowing the thickness of the metal, and then um, and then placing the film a certain distance away from the pinhole, you can calculate that, um, which was extremely helpful because pinhole photography is so iffy and does give you some sort of control over it. Now with the images themselves, it was interesting playing around a little bit with it, with those longer exposures and seeing then what happens if I move the camera a little bit, or if I do leave it somewhere in a very dark space where it's not gonna be picking up as much information. <laughs> this is for um, Amber. Um, oh, I've just, just moved away there. Um, yeah, Amber, so got a comment here says, lovely atmospheric images. How long does it take to produce a thin freeze? That's from Alan. Oh, okay. Um, to produce the uh, photopolymer prints, um, I think the the thing that made it longer for me was that I was purposefully um, trying to make it as long a process as possible. Um, so if you were to go ahead and purely just do that process, it probably wouldn't take too long. Um, I know, um, like Edinburgh printmakers, I'm not too sure about Glasgow print, um, probably also have the facilities um, but the process is quite similar to um, like some alternative photography processes um, the plate has like a UV film which you have to leave to develop and then you develop it in chemicals as well so if I was doing it usually I think it's the it's the traveling to and from and the shoot that takes up the time as well but I might say make the plate one day and I'll, I'll leave it for a day or two to develop um, depending on the light like if it's summer it might take a day um, if it's winter I'd leave it there a few days and if I'm in a rush then I might use like a UV bed to do it um, and then the following week I'd probably come back and um, spend a day or two printing um, from that plate just to make sure that um, I'm getting the prints that I want and that I figure out what kind of, um, how I need to tweak my process to get it right. Um, but if you were wanting to do purely that process, um, you could probably do it over a couple of days. But it is a really interesting process to get into if you're interested. Um, next question, um, this is for Adam. Um, you emphasize similarities and differences between you and your brother and mentioned his view of your work uh, out of interest. Is he artistic at all? Um, he definitely used to be. I feel like he's kind of parked his interest in art for like pursuit of sport. <laughs> and yeah, well, he studies, uh, I think it's sport coaching. So, and he, but he used to do GCSE art or something, but yeah, he's kind of part of that interest now. <laughs> That's great. Um, another question, please, for Amalia. Um, this is from Paul Watton, who says, uh, fascinating talk, Amalia. Um, do you think uh, analog versus digital affects the relationship of the photographer and or viewer to the image? Thank you, Paul. Um... Let me think about that briefly. Relationship between animals. Um, definitely, I, yeah, no, definitely actually, particularly because with digital images, they, I've, I, there are some writing that I've found that's actually arguing that digital images technically aren't photography, which the whole different side note of theory, but um, because they're so easily accessible or there's just so much more I'm finding I can do with digital and it comes so much more easily to be, um, not to be taking them, but to the process of taking them, find my relationship. And I can only speak for me personally, obviously, um, is very different to them. 
And with analog, I find myself a lot more precious about the images as I'm using film. And it's also, you know, it's such a more time consuming process um, where I, I find something very interesting happens then where I'm become almost, even if I take a really bad photograph, I almost want to just love the photograph because it's been such a process doing it. Whereas if I pulled out my digital camera, I do have a different relationship to it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. I have another comment from... Almost, even if I take a really bad photograph, I almost want to just love the photograph. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Alicia Chaudhry to Adam um, it says, beautifully explained. I really enjoyed all the explanation of the work. I just wanted to ask if you're planning on exploring this project further. That's Adam. Um, good question. I would definitely like to at the minute. Uh, my twin, he stays in England, so, and I'm living in Glasgow, so it's like two different levels of lockdown. So the logistics of it is quite tricky, but it's definitely a project that I feel like could just continue as a diverse, like, body of work. Um, and to be honest, I feel like I could take some photographs without him. Uh, so it's definitely a possibility. So one final question. Um, this is sort of to everybody. Um, so just chip in if you've got a comment. And it's from Alicia Bruce. It says, how are all the photographers feeling about the new opportunities that the pandemic has brought? Need to share work online, but also the wider, more global audience and opportunities for connection and dialogue brought about by the pandemic. This street level source and Jill Todd collaboration being one. Um, what was the best outcome of the pandemic in terms of your work reaching a wider audience and um, opportunities? Maybe I can start. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah? Uh, for me, this situation of pandemic, it's, I don't want to say it's amazing, it's not amazing, but for my personal growth, it's amazing because I had finally chance to get bored, at least for one day, and I started to learn how to use the sewing machine, uh, what is connected with a Sanayo type project that I started before pandemic. I originally, I wanted to print uh, Sanayo types on the textile and combine photography and textile. So now finally I got plenty of time to play around and develop my dream project with textiles and photography. Um, I'll come in if that's okay. Um, yeah, um, well, I think in general the pandemic is, I wouldn't say it's been a positive experience, but ultimately there are positives and negatives to it but like personally like it's been quite one good side effect for me is that um because I've not been able to get a job for so long I managed to get a bit of freelance film and photography work which means that now I'm self-employed which I wouldn't have, if I probably not I would have just been working in a bar which is what I did before um or doing cleaning or something so I think that obviously that's had its own challenges, not having income in the same way. And obviously many of us, I think all of us maybe didn't get a degree show, um, which has been difficult. But um, I guess I hope going forward, like I certainly feel like a, it's, it seems even more valuable to have like events like this and stuff because I, I miss art so much. <laughs> and so um, maybe it will make us, I don't know, more forthcoming and connecting with other artists and um, collaborating and um, just being more supportive as an artistic community. I would like to see that happening, definitely. Yeah, I think I would agree with Stella completely there. Like it's, it's, it's been tough because I think for most of us, it's probably put a halt on our practices. And of course, like leaving art school and there's always that thing in the back of your mind where you're like, what do I do now? I don't have access to facilities and like, oh no, I can't hire this. And I, you, you've got to kind of find your feet there. But at the same time, it has given me a lot of time to reflect and just to think about what, what I want from the work and how I'm speaking about it. And I think a big positive, although there have been a lot of negatives in kind of feeling 
kind of stuck with in some aspects with things but at the same time um like that kind of community strength which maybe in some senses wasn't there before um a lot of initiatives from like 2020 graduates and um there's been a lot of support from um galleries and places like street level that um i guess in some senses the work might have reached audience that it might not have um if it was a degree show but then i think a lot of us are missing that degree show so it, it's kind of a a bit a sweet situation like i really wish that we could have done that but at the same time i think works definitely reached new audiences and there's maybe been more opportunities in terms of online um participation and ways to get your work out there than if there wasn't so um, I think we'll just wrap things up here then. Um, if you want to view the exhibition, it's online at streetlevelphotoworks.org. It's in three parts and um, it will be on there um, until 20th of December. Um, so yeah, I just want to thank everyone for joining us and also for the really amazing talks from the artists. It was really strong work and it was great to hear um, about them as well after after seeing the images and you know having them online it's good to actually hear you speaking about it so thanks for taking the time to join us and uh, thanks to the audience as well and um yep yeah, thanks see you thanks everybody yeah.